Hyatt's Dwyer, June the 3rd, 2019. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk Andy Ruiz's upset of Anthony Joshua. Andy Ruiz is the new heavyweight champion. Now first, let me just say this. I'd like to know what odds everyone got. Let's make this a moment, right? I got 9 to 1 odds. On the telecast, they were throwing around 20 to 1 odds. I understand some Vegas casinos had 14 to 1 odds. Quite frankly, this brother's feeling a little bit ripped off. It's all good. It's all good. But tell us your story. What odds did you get on Andy Ruiz if you bet on him? Right? As an aside to people and to movies, this fight really reminds me of the scene in Color of Money where Paul Newman, with the big reputation, runs into Forrest Whitaker. And the scene ends with Forrest Whitaker asking Paul Newman, you think I have to lose some weight? Well, let me just say this. Was the problem with Anthony Joshua or was the problem with us? Right? Going into this fight, you didn't have to be deep or clever to realize that Andy Ruiz had the fastest hands of any opponent Anthony Joshua faced in his career. Right? Joshua never faced hand speed like this. You also didn't have to be that savvy to realize that Anthony Joshua going into the fight, whatever his status, had only had 22 professional fights. Less than Andy Ruiz, less than Tyson Fury, less than Deontay Wilder. Right now, given that all but one of his fights ended by knockout, you also didn't have to be clever to figure out here that Andy, excuse me, that Anthony Joshua might not know what to do when he's badly hurt. Right? He fought another giant in Vladimir Klitschko and Klitschko knocked him down. But then Klitschko looks at him. Joshua survives not because he comes in and clinches Klitschko. Right? Not because when he's hurt he suddenly has great defensive skills and has a hand up and is you know preventing Klitschko from finishing the job. No he survives because Klitschko who used to spar with him takes his foot off the gas. So all of us going into this fight should have at least thought that it was an unknown what would happen if Joshua got caught if the other guy stayed in the pocket and pursued him with fast hands, with combinations, with power punches, right? We should have at least thought, wow, is Joshua the kind of guy who could grab the shorter man like Ali grabbed Joe Frazier when he was hurt? Right? Understand, Ali gets blown out the first fight. The second fight, he's hugging Joe Fraser. Shouldn't have been allowed to. He's pushing down on Joe's neck. Going into this fight, what exactly did we know about Anthony Joshua's survival skills? Right? Well, let me just say a few things here, a few thoughts. Because understand, when they post odds, whether it's 9 to 1 or 14 to 1 or 20 to 1, those odds represent probabilities. So the 9 to 1 odds are telling you that if these two guys fought 10 times, Joshua would win 9 times to every one that Ruiz would win. Do you believe that now? Aren't the problems here structural? 
If I'm Anthony Joshua, and I know Joshua gets the first knockdown in the fight, it is an excellent left hook, no question about it. But if I'm Anthony Joshua, I have to ask myself, even with an immediate rematch clause, whether I'm going to know what to do with this guy's hand speed four or five months from now. I know they're trying to build up the zone, and I understand Joshua is one of the marquee fighters with Canelo on that network. Right? But if I'm Joshua, I really have to ask myself, right, am I ready for this guy again in an immediate rematch? Right? He might not be. Let me tell you, people around him need to have a frank talk with him. I've seen other guys who look like they were on rolls, Shane Mosley back in the day lose to a ringer, an excellent fighter who somehow was overlooked by the public, Vernon Forrest. And then, of course, mostly convinced because of the hype around him from the public, people like us, from the promoter, from his entourage. Because of the hype, he took on Vernon Forrest again. And guess what? The second time around, Forrest still had the jab. Forrest still knew how to use length. Forrest still had his skill set. I got news for you. I've watched Andy Ruiz for years. Four or five months from now, he's still going to have the hand speed. He's still going to be willing to stay in the pocket. This is a guy who gets dropped for the first time in his career. And when he gets off the canvas first, let's contrast Ruiz getting off the canvas to Joshua getting off the canvas. Right? Understand, Ruiz gets off the canvas. I want you to look at the tape. He shows the, the referee his gloves. Referee talks to him. Ruiz is active with the ref. He nods at the ref. He makes sure that his body language reflects his willingness to continue. Folks, after the second knockdown, after the second knockdown, the referee says to Joshua, walk to me. Right? Walk to me. I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of fighters. When a ref says, walk to me, that guy's practically running to the ref. He wants the ref to know player, I'm ready to continue, uh, flash knockdown, just got buzzed, I'm coherent, right? The ref says to Joshua, walk to me. Keep in mind, Joshua had been dropped by Klitschko, had already been dropped by Ruiz. So by the third knockdown in Joshua's professional career, he should have understood the urgency isn't he fighting an American on American soil? Hasn't he already been dropped in the fight? Right? Maybe the first time you're dropped and you get up, you say, well, the ref's not going to stop it now. The second time you get dropped, don't you get up thinking, hey, I, I got to show the ref that I'm serious here. Ref says to Joshua, walk to me. Joshua doesn't take a step terrible body language. I don't know if it was embarrassment, whether he wanted a way out, or whether it was a sense of entitlement. Folks, the ref's not on the Joshua payroll. The judges aren't on the Joshua payroll. This is a fight. The belts hang in the balance once the fight starts. You're not anyone special. You're just another fighter. So how Joshua gets off the canvas, looks at the ref. The ref says, walk to me. Walk to me. And Joshua doesn't move. The referee lets the fight continue. Joshua fans need to remember that. 
his reactions, his interaction with the referee after the second knockdown was absurd. Well, let's talk about some reasons he lost, because I want people watching this video to just key on some Joshua traits when you watch the replay. Now, understand, Joshua is truly a gifted puncher, right? He has one punch knockout capability with both hands, right? He can KO anyone. He has a devastating straight right hand, but his best punch in this fight by far was his left hook. Right, he lands that a few times. You'll notice his right hand is missing. Right, just like in the Joseph Parker fight. He's cautious, very cautious. I know CompuBox numbers show that he throws about 40 punches around that's the most cautious 40 punches I've seen in my life, right? He's hesitant. He's cautious. He doesn't want to open up. In my opinion, he needs a clear day to throw that right hand. He could not get it out of the holster. Now, I believe what's really going on here is that he knows his chin, I'm using the word chin to mean both his chin and his temple. His punch resistance, the shots up top. He knows his chin is not the best. Now in fairness to him, this is the heavyweight division. Right? Understand, Tyson Fury was down against Steve Cunningham. Tyson Fury was recently down twice against Deontay Wilder. We saw Dylan White down against AJ. We saw Dylan White down against Joseph Parker. You hit a guy the right way, the guy's going to go down. Anthony Joshua knows this. I believe he also knows he's big and clunky, not defensively blessed, and is open for counters when he throws that right hand. Right? And so here, he's in against a guy with blinding hand speed. He knows when he throws a punch, he's open for counters. And let's be blunt here. I don't care what the line was going in. Andy Ruiz has better counter-punching skills than Anthony Joshua. He does today. He will in four or five months when the rematch takes place. He does on American soil. He's going to have better counter-punching skills on British soil. Right? Andy Ruiz also has power. Right? His legs are hidden by baggy trunks. He doesn't have the muscular chirp, the definition of Anthony Joshua's. You actually see Joshua's muscles flex when he's throwing punches, right? You don't with Andy Ruiz, who's carrying a little bit more weight, right? But make no mistake about it. Ruiz is loading up on shots. The difference between the two guys is Anthony Joshua will get off a big left hook. You'll see it. It'll be like the first punch he throws. Right? By contrast, Andy Ruiz is throwing big punches, three, four punches into his combination. And he's two-handed. So understand, the first knockdown, the most important punch of this fight, by Andy Ruiz, the first time he drops Anthony Joshua. Ruiz has just been hit by a sharp left hook that gets inside his guard, right? Ruiz has his hand up here. The shot gets right inside. Ruiz goes down. Understand, Ruiz could have been badly hurt. He's so surprised by the shot 
that he falls on his arm. Right? He's out to the point where he's not even able to brace his fall. So he gets back up. Joshua comes over. What Joshua was not banking on. And understand, Joshua 6'6". Six, six. I believe Joshua thought a hurt Ruiz would go back and try to avoid him. Right? If you go back on Anthony Joshua and Joshua knows you can't counter him. In other words, you're not close to throw a combination. You're backing away. Right? Joshua's arms are longer than yours. You're backing away. Joshua knows you can't counter him. That's when he has the courage to throw that right hand. In this fight, and we mentioned this in the pre-fight video, Andy Ruiz was the stalker. He's the guy on his front foot from the opening bell, folks. Ruiz who's just gotten up off the canvas for the first time in his life decides he's going to come forward on Anthony Joshua. He stays in the pocket. In other words, Joshua's away. Ruiz gets off the canvas, talks with the referee. When they get back in the middle and Joshua wants to open up, throw wide punches, throw long punches that a 6'6 six, six fighter can. Ruiz comes forward ready to trade. What happens is Joshua lands on Ruiz. You see Ruiz's head snap back. Then you see Ruiz throw a combination. It's the left hook. I'm saying it here because Joshua asked his corner. He was caught so defenseless that Joshua had to ask his corner during the fight what hit him. It's a left hook, hits him on the temple, right? His equilibrium is gone. He is never the same the rest of the fight, right? Let's just say when Joshua was hurt, defensive fighters would act like Floyd Mayweather did when he got buzzed by Shane Mosley. They'll grab you. They'll grab an arm. They'll do something to give themselves five, ten seconds to clear their head. Right? They'll force the referee to come between the two of you. And even as the ref says, let's let go, they'll hold the other guy until the last minute. Joshua just goes down, folks. Right? Andy's in his face. Andy's throwing hard punches. Joshua can't handle any of the punches. In other words, it's not that Joshua is getting hit and dropped. No, it's more that Joshua is getting hit and hurt. And Andy continues to throw punches. So that second knockdown in the third round, right, it looks like an accumulation of punches, right? Joshua doesn't have his balance. You know that, right? I, I want people to look at Joshua walking to his corner at the end of the third round. I want people to look at Joshua after the last knockdown. Walk to the corner. I'm sure the referee saw him swaying a little bit in the wind. Joshua's hurt. The problem is once he's hurt, he can't defend himself at all. In other words, Andy's coming in with a combination. Joshua gets dazed, right? One of the knockdowns, Andy starts it with a straight left hand, right? Joshua's dazed, doesn't quite know what to do. Then Andy comes in, starts throwing punches. Joshua just leans to get away, falls down. Right? Joshua doesn't have it in him to do a George Foreman. In an earlier video, I talked about how Foreman would have his hands like this, the Archie Moore crab defense. Right? So a guy is throwing punches on Foreman. Foreman gets buzzed. Foreman goes like this to protect himself. 
right, to weather the storm. Anthony Joshua doesn't have a move like this. In other words, once you tag and hurt him, right, and you're still in his face, throwing hard punches, Joshua can't even pirouette away from you. Some fighters will just move to the side of the pocket or try to get behind you. Right? Joshua doesn't have that. Let me say this too. He's 6'6". Again, only 22 fights. Gifted puncher. But he doesn't know how to use length. So you see other tall fighters. Vitaly Klitschko comes to mind. Ali comes to mind. Right? You hit them or you get in their grill. And a Vitaly or an Ali leads. Right? That lean is a big part of their game. Especially when they're fighting a shorter guy who doesn't have the reach to hit him outside of the lean. Right? Joshua is big and clunky. By that I mean he's flat footed. He's not on the balls of his feet. Right? His balance is clunky. He's not fluid. Right, so he's not the big guy who can, as you throw punches, lean back, have the punch end here. He's not the guy who gets hurt who then has the choice. Am I going to move forward and clinch him? Or am I going to take a step back and move away from the pocket? He doesn't have those legs. Right? His legs aren't great, right? This isn't Manny Pacquiao. This isn't Vasyl Lomachenko. So, let me say too, there's a moment in the fight, and his trainer's name is McCracken, where his corner says to him, stick and move, basically. Hit him with a jab and back up. Now that's called a back foot game. That's what Joseph Parker used to be awarded a decision against Andy Ruiz during Ruiz's first attempt at the heavyweight title. Right? You actually see Joshua at one point try to get up on the balls of his feet. Folks, 22 fights into his career, I guess now it's 23, Joshua doesn't have the confidence to just jab and move backwards. Right? He doesn't have the level of back foot game that Joseph Parker does. When I heard McCracken say to Joshua, you know, jab him and move, right? I thought, what fighter does he think he has? <laughs> this is a flat footed slugger who wins by KO. Only Joseph Parker has gone the distance with him. Right? This isn't a guy who is going to move away and be up on the balls of his feet. Maybe he's able to do so against 40-year-old Vladimir Klitschko. Andy Ruiz is 29 years old. By the way, that's the other wrinkle in the fight. Right? I know Joshua, excellent, excellent amateur pedigree. Right? Andy Ruiz, excellent amateur pedigree. Joshua, 29. Andy, 29. Right? The idea that the betting market had Andy as a 9 to 1 and bigger underdog was absurd here. Especially against a guy who had already been on the canvas. Right? A guy who hadn't fought this level of hand speed before. Let me also say this too, and old timers will know where I'm coming from. In the 1970s, you looked at fighters, right? Ernie Shavers, hellacious puncher, but not cut up. Right? Jerry Quarry, who beat Ernie Shavers, not cut up. 
Right, in the 1970s, understand Ken Norton was an aberration at heavyweight, where you looked at the guy, and the guy looked like a weightlifter. Most fighters didn't. And I'm talking about guys with big punches. You didn't want to get on the other end of a Joe Fraser left hook. You just didn't. Joe wasn't cut up. Right? You get to the 80s. You know, Larry Holmes wasn't cut up. Jerry Cooney, big time puncher, was not cut up. George Foreman, when he comes back from his retirement, was not cut up. Right? I'm talking about some of the biggest punchers of the era. Right? Big punchers. How cut up is Buster Douglas, for crying out loud? And he beat Mike Tyson. Now somehow, we're supposed to believe that Andy, who's not that big, right? He looks flabby standing next to Anthony Joshua. Which one of us wouldn't? Joshua has like nobody fat, right? But understand, if you're a fan of the National Football League, every draft, every draft, every game you watch, you're going to hear about guys who are about 6'2", who weigh 260. Right? There are going to be linemen who weigh much more than that at 6'2". The key here is to realize that Andy is an athlete. Folks, much faster hands than Anthony Joshua. Combination puncher. Right? Joshua is a 1-2 guy. Right? Andy Ruiz is literally throwing four or five punches at times. Right? Also, in terms of coordination, who looked more coordinated in this fight? Andy gets dropped once. Right? Gets hit, falls back on his hand, gets back up. It's still coordinated. Right? I would say Andy is much more coordinated. And I mean much more coordinated than Anthony Joshua. And just to understand, too, I know Joshua looked like a giant next to Andy because Joshua is 6'6". But Andy is very coordinated for 6'2". Right? Andy's an athlete. Sure, he's, you know, doesn't look like a weightlifter. But this is an athlete. Right? There have been other fighters. Buster Mathis, for those of you from the 1960s, who looked big who actually had a lot of boxing skills. Folks, I thought the sport was boxing. I'll agree. I myself would vote for Anthony Joshua if it's a weightlifting contest, right? Or if it's a bodybuilding contest. Okay, fine. But this is boxing. So in terms of athleticism, coordination, fast hands, Andy Ruiz, the shorter man, had the advantage. And understand, this is the way boxing operates. It's on a cycle type basis. You have giants like the Galveston giant, Jack Johnson. Not so big by today's standards, but huge back then. Right? Jess Willard. Right? And then, of course, a shorter guy who moves better, with better coordination, Jack Dempsey comes along. Right? You have the Joe Lewis era. Who beats him? Ezard Charles. Smaller guy. Can move better. Stuff like that. Right? Sonny Liston. Puncher, I would argue, is Jazz's best punch, but reputation as puncher destroys Floyd Patterson in the first round twice. Right? Who does he fight? Big underdog at the time. Ali. Who moves better? Right? Who's more fluid? who's more organized. Well, understand, faster hands. Well, understand, we're coming out of, we're still in, but we're coming out of a big, clunky, heavyweight era. Right? Do any of the people watching this video know whether Deontay Wilder has a back foot game? Does anyone watching this video, at this point, given the information we've learned from this last fight, 
feel that Anthony Joshua has a great back foot game and knows how to use his height to avoid punches. Right? As I've said in earlier videos, let me say this too. Tyson Fury has a great back foot game. But understand, Tyson Fury himself in an interview, when asked about his toughest fights, mentioned cruiserweight Steve Cunningham. A guy who's smaller, more coordinated, fast, elusive, fluid. Right? Those are the kind of things that would get a Tyson Fury in trouble. And you have that right now. You know, Alexander Usyk at heavyweight. Well, just understand, in this environment, now that you know that Anthony Joshua doesn't move that well, doesn't know how to handle a hand speed, an opponent's hand speed and combination punching, is a hunter who doesn't quite know what to do when he's the hunted. A fighter who, quite frankly, doesn't have the best punch resistance in the world. Right now that you know that this guy has some flaws, and now that you've already seen the doctor delay the start of a round, when Luis Ortiz was this close to the heavyweight title, and the doctor gives... Deontay Wilder, time to recover, quite frankly, while he's doing, and you know, while he's examining Deontay Wilder in a fight in which Wilder has never hit the canvas, right? Very questionable stuff. Now that you've seen Wilder hurt, look at the Eric Molina fight, right? Now that you've seen Wilder hurt, now that you've seen Joshua hurt, now that you've seen Tyson Fury knocked down twice, how did he get up? After the second knockdown in the Deontay Wilder fight, people should realize that all of these men are mortal. Boxing is a highly competitive sport. Highly competitive. Men like Andy Ruiz, who've already fought for the heavyweight title. Keep in mind, the guy fights a damn good fighter, jo Joseph Parker. At a minimum, he went 12 rounds. Whoever you think won that fight, the fight went 12 rounds. So when you know there's a guy... By the way, Parker goes 12 rounds, only man to do so, against AJ. So when you know Andy Ruiz has fought world-class competition before, right? And understand that Parker fight is one of several world-class fights Andy Ruiz had. When you know no man is mortal... When you've seen all of these guys hurt before this fight, wasn't that Anthony Joshua on the canvas against Vladimir Klitschko? Right? All I'm saying is, how do we get ridiculous odds like 9 to 1, 14 to 1, and 20 to 1 in a fight between a legitimate world class competitor and a heavyweight champion who only had 22 pro fights? So my advice to AJ, given that he's a big puncher who has at least a puncher's chance in every fight, right? my advice to him is, hey, player, don't exercise the immediate rematch clause right now. Right? Understand, people still want to fight him. Right? However, the Deontay Wilder, Luis Ortiz, uh, Tyson Fury sweepstakes plays out. The winner of it is going to want to fight Anthony Joshua. Right? It's just that simple. You don't solve hand speed. You just don't. In four or five months. Right? Joshua is in his late 20s. You saw how unprepared he was, and I mean unprepared, to be hurt in the pocket against a combination puncher. Right? None of the Joshua knockdowns have him looking good. 
He doesn't get knocked down while rolling away from a punch and looking clever. You know, you don't see a knockdown where you say, oh, Andy squeezed that punch into a tight window. No, no. Joshua's like this. He gets hit on the side of the head. Goes down. Joshua, that second knockdown of the third round, look where they are. One guy is 6'6", six, six, right, has at least a four inch height advantage on the other guy and has a reach advantage. And where is Joshua? Just ring placement. He's over by the ropes. He has nowhere to go. Right? Depending on what his contracts say. If his contracts say you lose the zone contract if you don't fight immediately in the UK. Okay. Depending on what his contract says. If I'm him, I realize, hey, if I'm going to stay in this sport for a long time, if I have long-term plans, given that he's in his 20s, he's a baby in the heavyweight division. Let's get serious. Luis Ortiz is 40. Right? Tyson Fury's in his 30s. Right? Deontay Wilder's in his 30s. If I'm AJ, I say, look, I don't see how it helps my career to fight Andy Ruiz again. Understand that rematch can only play out one of two ways, folks. Either Joshua catches Ruiz, who's only been down <laughs> once. That's to Joshua. Gets off the canvas, drops his opponent two times in the same round. Right? Either Joshua catches Ruiz early or Ruiz methodically beats him up completely embarrasses him right let me just say this the truth about that fourth knockdown is that whether or not the referee let that fight continue you knew that fight was over you knew Andy Ruiz was not afraid of Anthony Joshua, had no hesitation being deep in the pocket. Right? None whatsoever. You knew Andy knew, more than anybody else in the building, that he could hurt Anthony Joshua. Right? You had Joshua really reduce the pot shotting at that point. Understand too what speed does. It dampens your opponent's output. Right, Joshua was in there afraid to throw punches because he knew, I throw the right hand, he can counter me on this side. Right, if I, if I throw a punch and, and not ready, and the guy comes back with the combination, I think Joshua understood he didn't have the skills, quite frankly, to tie up Andy. It's very hard to tie up a guy when the guy's throwing a combination. Also, let's give credit where credit is due. I want people to look at Andy's accuracy here. When Andy gets deep in the pocket and he lets his hands go, folks, it's not for show. He's landing shots on Joshua. One of the secrets to Andy is that he does better against taller fighters. Alexander Demetrenko quit in that fight. He'd been hit with so many hard shots up close that he just said, enough. I can't handle the guy's hand speed. I can't handle the guy's high percentage of power shots. Understand when Andy gets here on AJ, AJ's practically defenseless. Right? The best punch he throws in this fight is that short left hook that drops Andy the first time. But you realize that AJ is a guy who needs a clear day to throw punches. Right? He's hesitant to throw punches like that when the bullets are flying. Right? So. My advice, given that I remember Shane Mosley, how high he was, we were talking about him being one of the best fighters ever at lightweight. 
right? I remember how Shane was viewed. He had beaten Oscar De La Hoya, if you believe the judges' scorecards after that second fight. I didn't, but he'd beaten Oscar De La Hoya twice. He was riding high. He's at a press conference. Vernon Forrest says, hey, this is like a scene out of Rocky. Hey, when are you going to give me a shot? You know what happens. He gives Vernon a shot. Vernon beats him. The people around him should have said, player, you've done a lot of great things in the sport. Let's stay away from this man for now. Right? For now. While we fight other guys, get back our confidence, develop a few skills that will help us with this man. Understand, Ali did not fight Fraser in the rematch immediately after losing to him the first time. Right? Did not happen. Fighters need to realize whatever contractual rights you have, sometimes it's just flat out a bad idea to fight a guy whose style has conquered yours immediately without having a solution. I don't believe Joshua had a bad night. I believe this was structural. I believe the fight was badly mispriced. I look forward to your comments and I look forward to hearing what odds you got on this. Thanks for stopping by.